being recorded, but um, just so everybody knows we are being recorded now. Okay, if you have a question, please use the Q&A box if you can. If you notice at the bottom of your screen, there is a little thing that says Q&A, and that's a great place for you to enter in your questions. It helps to keep them a little more organized so that I can see them sometimes in the chat. If a bunch of people are posting stuff in there, it's really easy to lose questions. So that Q&A just helps me keep better track of your questions to make sure that I've answered everybody's. Um, see for your safety i should only be you should only be able to see what i post in the chat but just in case i missed a setting or something um, please don't click on links other than what i might post so i'm also going to post a link in there to a pdf of a brochure now this is my absolute favorite brochure that we put out affectionately known as the yellow brochure and it's our native landscaping brochure. So if you're looking to put native plants in your yard, this brochure will give you hundreds of ideas, all different um, plants, all different soil types or moisture types, um, different sun, shade, all of that. So there's tons of ideas in there for you to use. All right, and um, just a little TCF housekeeping. Our native plant and veggie plant sale has been changed to online ordering with contactless pickup. Orders will be taken May 1st through 3rd with pickup on May 8th and 9th. So if you're looking to get some native plants for your yard, that's a great way to do it. Place your order online, then you pull up at the McDonald farm and they'll load them up for you. So uh, it's a great way to get your hands on some native plants, but take a look at, um, there's not gonna be any browsing like we've done in the past, so it's all online ordering. Also, um, as you may or may not know, I've been doing these webinars every Monday and Thursday at one o'clock. So next week, our upcoming webinars, Monday, we have why we need a nature fix with a guest speaker. So Jan Rail from our office is going to be talking about what we call Nature Rx. So that idea of why nature is good for us. So that's going to be a really good one. Um, I will throw that link in the chat as well so that you can join us on Monday. Boom, there's that one. Then we have a special non-series webinar on Tuesday at 1 p.m. with guest speaker Pam Otto. She's gonna be presenting on Coyotes to Bees, Nature in the Fox River Valley. So that one's gonna be going on as well. And I will put that one also in the chat. And there's that one. Okay, so there's a lot of links in the chat for you to take a look at. Um, and I think, and then, oh, Thursday next week is going to be common invasive species and what to plant instead. So that's gonna be back to me again. And that looks to be a really good one too. So if you're looking for some suggestions on native plants that you can put in your yard, other than some of the invasive exotic things that we've got out there. That'll be a good one too. So um, let's take a look at the results of our poll here. I'm gonna go ahead and share those results with you. So you can see we've got four people from DuPage, three from Will, two from Kane. And it looks like, again, about two thirds of you have been able to take a walk in the woods. And you heard about us on Facebook or from our newsletter or a friend. Very good. All right, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen with you. There we go. And we'll start our slideshow. So spring ephemerals. These are my absolute favorite group of plants, and I'm so excited that I get to share these with you today um, because they are really just such an interesting group of plants. But first, a little bit about TCF, uh, the Conservation Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, and have been since 1972. So we improve the health of our communities by preserving and restoring natural areas and open space. So it's great to have outdoors and open space for us to walk around in for the animals, for the birds and the butterflies, but it's also really good for our health. Those of you who've been stuck inside know how important it is to get outside and just be able to, you know, breathe some fresh air, see some things that aren't the inside of our houses. So, and we're also accredited, which 
probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you, but just know that it's a really, really big deal. So we have helped to preserve nearly 35,000 acres of land on 200 different parcels. So you can kind of see there our main service areas are Kane, Kendall, DuPage, and Will counties. Um, but we branch out into other counties as projects demand too. So um, we've got lots going on out there. And preserving open space is really important because it helps to protect our water quality um, for the water that we drink. It improves our air quality, wildlife habitat, and that's really important to protect it for our kids and other future generations, just so that they have open spaces to play and places to get outside um, and, and get to see the same nature that we get to enjoy. All right, so moving right into it, what is a spring ephemeral? I know this is kind of a fancy, sciencey sounding word, but basically it means this particular group of plants that grow in the early spring and flower and go through really their whole life cycle in the span of about a month in the early spring. Why do they do that? Well, because by and large, these plants live in the woods. So since we have deciduous forests here, the trees all lose their leaves over the winter and more sunlight can get down to the forest floor. So these plants take advantage of that early part in the spring before the trees have totally leafed out and blocked all their sunlight. So while some of that sunlight is still getting down to the forest floor, these plants shoot up, they flower, they do their flowery plant thing. And then when, by the time the canopy closes, they're kind of done. So you have this very narrow window in the spring to really get to enjoy these plants. Some of them stay green throughout the summer. Some of them completely die back. So it all depends on what plant we're talking about. But that's generally the idea of these. It's this very short-lived group of plants that come up in this very narrow window of time in the early spring. And this is that window. So if you have a chance to get out in the woods, these are some of the things you might be seeing out there right now. Um, I know I have Virginia bluebells in my yard. We'll talk about those in a minute. And those are coming up now. Mine haven't quite flowered yet. I've been seeing pictures of other people who are just starting to flower. So, you know, this stuff is happening right now. So that's why these guys are so cool. So let's start, got to start with one of my favorite, favorite native plants here. And that is wild ginger. Now I put the scientific name up there for you too, in case you're trying to find them at a nursery or something. So common names can get a little tricky because there are some plants that one common name, depending on where you're at, can refer to two or three different species. So to avoid that confusion, scientific names are very specific. So they're specific to one plant. So that way, when you're trying to find these things later, everybody's kind of on the same page there. So that's why I've given you the scientific name of the plant as well as the common names as I've learned them. Other people may have other common names, that's really cool too. So anyway, wild ginger is one of my absolute favorites. It's this really low growing plant with these great big heart shaped leaves. It's a great ground cover if you've got a woody area that you're looking to um, plant in and you want some kind of a low growing ground cover, it's my absolute favorite. So these beautiful heart-shaped leaves with kind of the reddish looking stems, the flowers are super bizarre. A lot of, of these spring ephemerals have really weird shaped flowers. So, but the flowers grow underneath the leaves. So they're not real obvious. Sometimes you kind of have to go hunting for them, um, but they've got sort of that brown or very, very deep burgundy colored flower. So really a fun one. And Despite the name, it's not related to the, um, uh, what's it called, tropical ginger, which is the kind that we eat that you might see in a lot of Asian cooking. Um, that's tropical ginger. Wild ginger's not even close, not even in the same family. But the roots actually taste very, very similar. So this is one of those where the roots are edible. Um, and I've done it where I've you know taken a little piece of the root and you, you peel off the outside of it and you just kind of take a little nibble and it's such an intense ginger flavor. It, it actually makes the tip of your tongue go a little numb, um, but very, very intense flavor. Native Americans used to cook with it. Um, they used it as a food flavoring a lot. So um, it's really just a cool plant. So, and, and definitely one of my favorites. 
All right, wild geranium. This is an absolutely adorable little plant. It grows in, um, as, as the sort of colony gets bigger, it gets a little bit bushy, but um, another lower growing plant with a very cute little pink, pinkish purplish flower on there. Um, a very nice one to plant if you've got a shady area or an, an area sort of on the edge that gets a little bit of sunlight, but still stays mostly shady. Um, they're not super particular about their sun requirements, but this is another one. The leaves are out now. It's not quite flowering yet, but you can start to see the leaves of this coming up. It's got that very deeply lobed leaf on there. Um, just a really cute flower. Always a fun one to come across in the woods. Spring beauties. Oh, these are another great one. So spring beauties are one of the very first Okay, obviously um, skunk cabbage, obviously the first flower that comes up, but spring beauties aren't too far behind. So these little guys, teeny tiny little flower, teeny tiny little leaves, um, just very delicate little guys. You can see in that center picture there. Um, one of the really cool things I find about the spring beauties though, um, you know, we, we know what we can see, but insects can actually see a wider range uh, on the spectrum than we can. And so what's not obvious to us on here is that these flowers are actually painted with stripes that we can't see. So yeah, we can see the little pink veining that's in there, but there are colors in there that are not visible to humans, but insects can see them. And it basically makes like a landing strip so that it's, it, it's directing the insects, you know, like right here, pollen and nectar right here. So it, interesting to think about this, this means of communication that plants and insects have that we're completely oblivious to because it's outside of what we can see. So, and it, it, I mean, it's like neon lights on there. If, if you, uh, I've, I've seen, they've been able to take pictures of them and, and adjust the lighting so that it brings those colors into a range that we can see. And it's like neon lights right here. So very fun, adorable little plant. Um, and I've seen these naturalized through people's yards, which is kind of fun because then you get these little pops of color um, in the early spring as things are just starting to grow. Cut leaf toothwort. This is another fun one. It, it looks kind of similar. Uh, the flower looks kind of similar anyway to spring beauties um, without that pink veining in them, um, but the leaves are a little bit different. The leaves kind of remind me of just a like an even more deeply lobed uh, geranium. But these plants grow, again, fairly low growing. You know, they don't get 12 inches tall generally, but they'll grow in like a little cluster, as you can see in that photo on the right, um, right in alongside spring beauties. And they'll grow right up through the leaves on the forest floor. So. Um, another really nice early spring plant. Um, interesting thing about toothwort. So back in the days of the pioneers and the Native Americans, they had something they called the doctrine of signatures. And, and the idea here was if something looked like a part of the body, that plant could be used to treat that part of the body. Okay, kind of weird. Um, but the roots of toothwort, thus the name, kind of resemble a tooth. So they thought, well, it looks like a tooth, therefore you must be able to use it to treat toothaches. So they would make a poultice out of the roots and use it to treat toothaches. I don't know that it's ever, anybody's ever been able to show that it really does help beyond, um, you know, the placebo effect or, you know, the alcohol that they were soaking it in anyway to, you know, was, was actually what was helping. Um, but that was the idea. So that's where it got the name from, toothwort, was because it was used to treat toothaches because the roots resembled teeth. All right, kind of along those same lines here, we have bloodroot. So bloodroot gets its name from the fact that when cut, the roots have a very reddish sap in them. And it, it really does kind of look like blood, it's weird. Um, but this is, I, I think the leaves on these are so cool, just those, because they're, and they're pretty big too. Um, but when they first come out of the ground, as you can see in that picture on the left, the 
leaf is just sort of wrapped around the stem. And by the time the flower opens, then it sort of unwinds itself. Um, but it's just, it's, it's a really pretty plant um, and very fun to find a nice little colony of these growing out in the woods. Uh, my favorite place to visit for all these spring ephemerals, by the way, is Messenger Woods in Homer Glen. Um, unfortunately, with everything going on right now, all the forest preserve parking lots are closed, but if you can access it, man, now is really the time to get out and start looking for all of this. Um, I do believe O'Hara Woods in Romeoville, you can still get in there. That's um, owned by the village, I believe. So there's places to park. You can get into park there and um, get in to walk around there. But um, that's also a place that's very full of these spring ephemerals. It's really a great place to go walking and looking for all of these plants. Virginia bluebells, man. This to me is the iconic spring ephemeral. They're, they grow in these big clusters, especially if you go to Messenger Woods. Um, there's a couple of areas that are just carpeted in these guys. So they've got these purple, bluish purple bell-shaped flowers to them. And they grow, the flowers come out at the top in kind of a cluster. And anytime I was doing hikes with kids, I would always say, they smell like Fruit Loops. And people look at me like I'm nuts. Like, I don't even know what Fruit Loops smell like. Well, you do. You remember that from a, when you were a kid. If you take a cluster of those flowers in your hands and just sort of stick your face right in there, take a big whiff, it's got that sweet sort of fruity smell to it. And every time without fail, kids would do that, take a big, big sniff and go, oh yeah, it does. Weirdest thing ever, but definitely they smell like Fruit Loops. So this is another beautiful one. If you can get them to grow, um, they're gorgeous. I've, I've managed to get two growing in my yard and I absolutely love them. So um, this is one of my favorite things to see coming up every year because they are, they really are a very pretty plant. Okay, Solomon seal. So there's a couple different types of Solomon seal here. We've got smooth Solomon seal, false Solomon seal, and starry false Solomon seal. And as you can kind of tell from the pictures, the, the best way to tell them apart is where do the flowers grow? If the flowers are growing off the tip of the stalk that's got the leaves on it, they're growing at the tip, that's false Solomon seal. If the flowers are instead hanging down from each of the leaf nodes, that's true Solomon seal. Um, smooth, another name for it too. So um, similar looking plants where you've got that stalk and you've got the leaves sort of just stair-stepping their way up that stalk. So the, the leaves on these are fairly large. And this is another one that grows pretty readily. Um, I've got an area in the back of my yard that is, you know, full of honeysuckle and all kinds of junk. And I've been slowly clearing it out. And without even me planting anything back there, all of a sudden now I've got Solomon seal growing up in there. I forget whether it's smooth or false, but um, it, it's one of those that it will come back pretty readily when you clear areas. So, um, Fun fact about this one, the name comes from the fact that if you take a cross section of, I forget if it's the stem or the leaf, um, it supposedly resembles the seal of Solomon, who's mentioned back in the Bible and historical records. So the royal seal that he used um, looks apparently very similar to the cross section of that. So that's where the name comes from, Solomon seal. May apples. This is a fun one. I always love showing these to kids because they kind of resemble fairy umbrellas. So these guys grow about a foot tall and they grow for at least two years. The first year they grow, there's only one leaf at the top. So it grows like one straight thing with this big leaf on top and they look like umbrellas. So the kids always called them fairy umbrellas. So that's still how I refer to them today as little fairy umbrellas. Um, the second year, the stem, top of the stem sort of splits, and now you've got two leaves, each one coming off one of, that, one of those splits. And then in the center, you get that little white flower that turns into a fruit. Now, supposedly that fruit is edible when it is ripe, but you gotta get it at like just the right time. If you get it before it's ripe, it's poisonous or it doesn't taste good or super bitter or something, I don't know. 
Um, but apparently it was frequently used to make jelly. May apple jelly is a big thing. Um, but this is another really sweet one. This is a clonal plant. So if you plant one or two, the next year you'll have two or four and so on. So they'll pretty readily um, multiply. So I started a little patch in my yard and it doesn't get out of control too bad, but um, they definitely will multiply and, and spread. Trout lilies. This is another really fun one. This is another one of the really early plants that comes up. We've got a couple different kinds around here, um, a, basically a white and a yellow. So trout lily, the name for this comes from the fact that the modeling on the leaves tends to resemble a trout's skin. Um, they've got a couple of other names for them too. There's a couple other common names out there for these. Um, they're escaping me at the moment. Um, I always learned them as trout lily, but um, yeah, so this is another one that comes up. Um, you'll see them in little clusters. They'll come right up through those leaves and um, put up their flowers real quickly, um, and then they're gone. So in a, you know, this is another one that's, you know, in the span of about a month, they're up, they flower, and then they disappear until next year. So um, I always liked finding these two. They're super, super pretty. Jack in the pulpit. This is an, this is probably one of my favorite plants only because of just how weird it looks. I love weird flowers. Um, so Jack in the pulpit has the leaves. It's got three leaves and then it's got, this is actually the flowering structure right here. So this little thing in the center is supposedly the Jack with the pulpit around him. And so you got Jack sitting up like this and then that kind of thing just so sort of folded over the top of it. Um, really bizarre looking flower and can sometimes be mistaken for a pitcher plant. No, it really isn't. Um, the leaves are sometimes mistaken for trillium. Again, just because there's three of them and they're fairly large. Um, but then after the flower, this is the fruiting body right here. So this, this is the fruit of the Jack in the Pulpit plant. Almost looks like, a I don't know, maybe a bizarre red ear of corn or something. But common to see, and they come really late. They're not like right behind the flower like a lot of plants are. Um, they'll show up sometimes even closer to fall, you'll start to see them. Um, but related to Jack in the Pulpit is something called Green Dragon. It's the same genus, different species. This one has a lot more leaves to it, even though the leaves look kind of similar, the plant itself grow looks kind of similar to Jack in the Pulpit. More leaves and in kind of that whorl and then this is the dragon part. Where's my pointer? There it is. This is the dragon part right here. So it looks like you got the dragon's head with a long tongue sticking out of it. Another really cool plant to see out in the woods. Very uncommon. Um, I, I don't think it's endangered or anything, but it's just, it's not a common one to see. So when you do see it, it's, it's a real treat. Trillium. This is a family of plants that I just absolutely love. This is another one, um, Messenger Woods in Homer Glen, full of trillium. Um, the trillium grandiflorum, large flower trillium, gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous plant. Huge flower on it. Um, trillium, the name comes from the fact that it has three leaves on it, so try. Um, but so they all have these three leaves and then there's a red trillium or purple trillium um, and then the white trillium or large flowered. Um, so lots of different species. I'll be real honest with you. I don't know how to tell the difference between recurvatum and sessile. And I just noticed that, thank you, uh, autocorrect, it capitalized things that I didn't want capitalized. Um, I don't know how to tell the difference between per like purple and red, for example. Somebody told me one time, and I honestly don't remember. Um, they're really hard to tell apart. Um, the white trillium and the large flower trillium, obviously, large trillium, the flower is going to be about this big. White trillium, the flower is going to be about this big. So another one can be a little bit difficult to tell apart, but when you see the large flower, you, you'll know it. Um, and then also I mentioned the 
Trillium verde, which is the green flowered trillium, that is a state endangered plant. If you know where one is, let me know. <laughs> I've never seen it in the wild. Um, but it, it's, it's supposedly here, but it is state endangered. So trillium, very, very fun group of plants. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, they always flower right around Mother's Day. So um, I, I would always try to make a trip out to messenger woods to see these because there's just carpets of them everywhere. It's gorgeous. All right, Dutchman's breeches. This is one that is blooming right about now. Um, I always love the leaves on this. They look so lacy and delicate and pretty. Um, and then you have the flowers on there, which is, like I said, a lot of these spring ephemeral flowers are just kind of weird looking. So they named obviously because they looked like the pants a Dutchman would wear, I guess. Um, but you know, they look like the little pants um, and it, it, again, there's a similar plant, has almost identical leaves to it, um, and that's squirrel corn. You can kind of see the difference there between the two. Squirrel corn looks a little more heart-shaped, whereas the Dutchman's breeches, you have like the two legs sticking out like this. Um, so I put that one in there just in case. I've only seen squirrel corn once out in the woods, and it was one of those where like, oh, it's Dutchman. Oh, no, it's not. So they look very similar. But if you look closely at the flower, you can you can definitely tell it's different. But um, real pretty one. A lot of times you'll find them growing at the base of trees. Um, I'm not sure. I, I took the picture in the middle. I don't remember where I took that. But um, it's always fun to find a, a patch of that. Those flowers are not very long-lived at all. Um, and like I said, now is about the time they're blooming. So if you want to see those, now is the time to go look. I threw this one in here just because it's it's a little bit different. Um, doll's eyes, obviously named after the, the berries, not so much the flower, but the berries that come up afterwards are white. One of those rare plants that has white berries on it. Um, and then the little black dot in the center makes it look like the eye of a doll, I guess. Um, I know there used to be some of this when I worked up at, um, Oh, what's that called? Fullersburg Woods. I used to work at Fuller, the Nature Center at Fullersburg Woods, and I know there was a patch of that up there. Um, so that's the one place that I've seen this. Um, again, the, those berries are just so cool, very pretty. And again, look how weird that flower is, right? Not your typical, you know, aster-shaped flower. So another very fun one. This, again, as I, as I, see, I seem to recall it being a kind of bushy and those, um, the flowers up, coming up on a little stalk. So if you want to bring these types of flowers to your yard, obviously, because they grow in woody areas, you want a, an area that's kind of shady. So shady or part shade is probably best. Um, and then depending on which plant you want to plant, you want to see if your soil is wet dry or mesic. Mesic just means sort of, it's that Goldilocks, kind of somewhere in the middle. It's not too wet, not too dry, just kind of right there in the middle. So um, take a look at what those conditions are before deciding on what you want to plant there. And then um, some plants grow better around certain trees and some trees will inhibit the growth of other plants. So definitely take a look at what's causing the shade if you've got trees in there to, to um, get an idea of what kinds of things you might be able to plant there. So again, just going to plug our conservation at home program. So we've got um, probably over a thousand certified properties at this point, but you give us a call and once we are no longer sheltering, um, we'll, we can come out, walk around your yard with you and make recommendations about different plants that you can put in. Um, I've I've been doing phone certification, or not certifications, but phone consultations right now. So if you are interested in a, a conservation at home consultation, you can drop me an email and maybe send me some pictures and we can definitely do a phone consultation like that. And why do we talk so much about native plants? Well, they're really important for our ecosystems. So they're good for our birds and our butterflies. It's that familiar food that they know. And by having those plants there, it's 
encouraging them and it's helping them because some butterflies and um, some, uh, some butterflies and other insects, other pollinators require certain plants in order to lay their eggs on or for nectaring because their mouth parts are shaped just so, so that they fit into the flower parts. So by planting those natives, you are really helping our native pollinators. By helping our native pollinators, you actually help the birds too because birds feed their babies a lot of times caterpillars. Caterpillars are very nutrient rich and a very good source of food for their babies. So um, by encouraging the pollinators, you're also encouraging the birds as well. So if you want to bring a lot of color and vibrancy to your yard, not only will the flowers do that, but they'll also bring in the birds and the butterflies. They also save you time and money because native plants are very good at tending to themselves. Because they have nice long roots, you don't have to water them as much. You don't have to fertilize them as much. You don't have to baby them and um, you know, trick them into thinking they're where they're supposed to be growing because this is where they're supposed to be growing. So um, all these native plants are, are really good things to have in your yard. And again, as I mentioned, we are the Conservation Foundation. So we're a nonprofit organization. We're a member-based organization. So you can become a member. And then you'll find out about all of our, um, you'll get updates on like these webinars that we're doing, as well as other events, other things like our, our plant sale, um, as well as our um, Green Earth Harvest program, which is um, the farm that is run from our McDonald farm in Naperville. So we, of the 60 acres on our McDonald farm, 49 of those are organically farmed. So the food that's grown there goes out to about 500 families who um, get a, um, I, we, we've changed the wording on it and I'm sorry, the, the words aren't coming to my head. Um, but you can be, become a member of our Green Earth Harvest and then you get shares of the produce weekly or every other week. Uh, we also have our other properties, our Dixon Merced Farm in Montgomery. They do lots of really fun events out there, um, like our Beer Bands and Barns Festival. So that's always a good time. Um, you can also follow us on social media. Again, that's where you'll get more updates on future webinars that we're going to be doing, as well as all the other really cool things. And, you know, your, just your daily dose of nature. Um, and then you can also get your yard certified. So with that, if you have any questions, I'm going to pull up my Q&A here, and uh, where's my chat? Where did my chat go? There it is, okay. So if you have any questions, please feel free to go ahead now, um, post them in the Q&A, or post them in the chat, and let me know. Otherwise, if there are any questions, anything else you're interested in, you can always drop me an email. That's probably the best way to get a hold of me right now as I'm working from home. Um, the phone number there is my desk line. I will still get the messages, but um, it's emails the easiest way to get a hold of me right now. So, all right, I am not seeing any questions. So, with that, I'm just going to say thank you for attending, and we hope to see you back again next week for the really awesome webinars that we have there. And if there's any, any other way I can help you, please don't hesitate to drop me a call or drop me an email. So I'm going to stop sharing there, and thanks, everybody. Hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.